Hello and welcome. Today I'm really looking forward to this session and we're going to be talking about three ways to elevate your clinic. So it's with a good friend of mine, Andy Hosgood, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, but I'm really interested in this topic because at Physiquip, we set the company up 10 years ago now, and it was always with the mission of bringing over the best technologies, but also how we can support people that are introducing that. So whether it's in professional sport, in the NHS, or was this one is going to focus on it in private clinics? That's really our core focus. So albeit we do sell equipment, it's how we can make it work for that particular client. So someone that I've worked with for a long time in this area is Andy Hosgood. So Andy, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for the invite. I'm looking forward to it. So Andy and I have known each other for, for, for about that 10 year period and we've had a real synergy in terms of the way that we see things where we genuinely we do want to um, well just help clients really and we, we see them more as clients than customers albeit we're selling equipment we see that when we sell something that's the start of the journey and even if we don't sell something to them we really do want to help drive things forward so I'm really looking forward to speaking with Andy about this today and answering some of your questions so, Andy, I'll uh, hand over to you. Thanks very much, Anne. No, I, I appreciate it. And like you say, I think, you know, we're very aligned in both of our missions. You know, one of the reasons why we, myself and Phil, set up Elevate Your Clinic was the fact that, you know, we really wanted to help the therapy industry to improve their business. You know, I've been very fortunate to run very successful businesses over the last you know, almost 20 years of my um, business journey. I'm working in, in, in private physio practices. And, you know, ever since we met, I thought our alignment of the greater mission of trying to help as many people as possible and offer as much support as possible as we could do to make the journey of running their therapy business as, uh, as less painful as possible to try and overcome as many obstacles before they do occur. And also to try and highlight or shine some light on areas that not everyone probably does pay attention to. So hopefully today we can uh, shine some light on those areas and uh, offer some helpful content to the, to the listeners and watchers. Great. Yep. Yeah, no, sounds good. Sounds good to me. So we'll kick off into the first point that we've come up with. So in terms of that, so it's starting off with what, where do you want to get to? Yeah. And I think it's a really important question. And I also think it's something which I, I believe that a lot of therapists may struggle with this. Um, and I'll expand on that. I think it's important that we, we take some time to really understand at any start of a business when we're in private practice is where, what are we looking to achieve? And I think there's lots of different things for different people. And for me, I always use the analogy that therapists are very good at this if they take the time to realize their own skill set. And what I mean by this is, you know, you come in as Andy Thomas with a sore back or a bad shoulder. And our job is to sit down and have a conversation with you to really understand what it is that you want to achieve. What sports do you like to play? What lifestyle do you want to live? So what is the goal of you then coming into the, into the, into the practice to see? what you want to achieve. So I think we're very good at that. I just think some therapists need then to kind of use that same methodology that they're almost honing in the treatment room and have that conversation with themselves. And I guess it all comes down to, you know, what it is that somebody wants to improve or what, what it is that they want to develop and grow. Is it that classic thing of, oh, I just want to increase my revenue? Is it, the fact of the looking to try and add new services you know it's over the last few years we've we've recognized haven't we that people are the nhs are uh, services and i think that's only going especially msk services are only going to increase and grow where people are then trying to take on um some nhs work or develop new services i know one of the things that we've talked about a lot is people are starting to specialize maybe more in going down individual kind of ways something we're very familiar with has been as a lot of private practices that have been involved in quite met a lot of medical legal work maybe or some private medical work um and are looking to maybe shift more into the self-pay model um or people are looking to expand i mean you know we're in a world of private healthcare now where because of you know 
this global pandemic and unfortunately the overwhelmed services in the NHS that I think, especially for musculoskeletal health, which is where I sit a lot of my work, um, a lot of people are looking outside of um, the NHS for those services. So I think, you know, the private health market potentially the next five years is going to be on a real big increase, which also means, and we've also got to touch on this point, that competition is going to be higher. So I think your goal, I think it's important that if you're listening to this, is to really understand what it is that you're looking to achieve and take some time to recognize, you know, what does the dream look like, you know, or how do you set your vision? And that's certainly something that we, when we work with anybody or we have conversations with people, if it's over a virtual coffee or anything, that we really seek to understand is what is it they're looking to set their goal? Does that all, does that kind of all make sense? No, it definitely does. And something that I'm interested in in general is how do people find you and what is their openness to, to having that discussion? Because again, this is, we, we love having this question. If someone, if we could have this conversation with one of our customers, we're not trying to just shoehorn some equipment in. It's like, right, where do you want to get to on this? So how, how does that process start with you? With our, in, in our, you know, it all starts with a coffee. <laughs> you know and and you know due to the world now it starts with a virtual coffee and i think that for us is because a two ways if we ever work with a, a client a customer however you choose to to use what terminology you know we've got to for us we've got to understand what it is that they are looking to achieve and if we can help be a part of that journey um, and secondly if there's a right fit because obviously I think it's important if you are getting any support in your business, you find somebody that's, you know, who has the same ethos as you, works in the same kind of way that you want to work on, especially if someone's going to come on on a coaching program with us. I think it's really important that, that we're aligned of how we, and the efficacy, and which is one of the reasons why I like working with, with yourselves at PhysiQuip is that, you know, one of the things I've always recognised is your, your ethics are very high, aren't they? You know, you don't do things for a sale. You do things because it's the best for the business based on that vision. And I think that's where I've always felt we're very aligned in the way that, that, that we want to help and support people. And I think for me also, whoever it is, if you are looking to buy some new kit or you are looking to get some support in your business to grow, recognizing that actually it's not about the the kit or it's not about the coach it's actually about the business and how the responsibility of some kit and the company that's come along and support with that or the coach that you choose to do um will help facilitate the journey for you and i think it, it goes back on have you ever have you ever heard of the book called the story brands no actually and it's when it's around about talking about who's the hero of the story and i think one of the, the big thing for us is 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 to recognize that for any business owner that they're the hero of the story and whoever else is just there to be a guide and facilitate that journey for them and that's kind of how we see ourselves and it's um along that way but it's always good to understand what like you've said what it is that you what we want to achieve because i think that's important that understanding the goals so you can be very clear on the direction of which you want to take it yeah, no, that's good. I'll definitely check that book out as well. Yeah, it's good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but then in terms of like, if you've got people say that don't speak to us or don't speak to you about things, how would you say, what's a really good way to just start off? If you've got, say, a team um, or a clinic, what's good for them if they're going to do it on their own? How do they define what their goal is? Yeah, well, uh, firstly, I think I think most business owners have an idea already in their head. I think they, but they, what we see is they, they keep it in their heads um it's not particularly very clear so i'm a very visual uh learner so for me it's you know i have a very clear picture in my head of what it was i wanted to achieve so i think some people have kind of got that but sometimes it can be quite vague and like you highlighted especially if you've got a team if your responsibility as a business owner is to lead a team and the goal of that business is stuck in your head then how on earth can you align, get your team aligned with your goal? And then how, how can you get your business aligned? So 
what I would suggest is, is it's about taking time out away from the business. I think that's something that people try and do is they're thinking about things while taking, you know, trying to take the kids to school or, you know, doing, doing their um, VAT or they're doing their tax or whatever, or that they're doing their admin. I think if you're going to do this and do this well, it's about taking time out into a quiet little area and just really ask, being honest with the question and saying, what is it I want? What, you know, what could, what really could I achieve if I wanted to in the next three to five years? And I think it's important to think that far ahead on the basis that it allows you to give you time to do things, you know, because we are busy. So I think it's important that you do take the time to really consider you know, dream big, but then give yourself the time to do it because there's nothing worse, is there, than trying to set a really big goal in a really short time frame and then just getting yourself stressed out or feeling bad because you haven't achieved it. So there's certainly that. And then find a way to articulate that to the team in the way that they're going to be, you know, that they're going to also understand it. You know, you write in a, it's a classic thing, you know, you go to, I don't know, you get, you write a business plan. And I don't know, you write a business plan to the bank or to borrow some money from a funding thing, then it has to be, you know, part dissertation, doesn't it? It has to be this thick and it has to be dead detailed. Well, you handing that out to your team isn't probably going to get a desired effect that you want. So, you know, for me, having a really clear understanding of where you want to do, and then I know we're going to talk on, you know, about then creating a plan of how you're going to do that and what that's going to look like. And just be comfortable articulating that with your team. Articulate what it's going to be. That might, might be a short presentation if that's something that you prefer. But the key thing for me is having it written down so that it can be a very aligned goal so that each and every person in your team can align to it. And you might also find that the people in your team, if your goal is big enough, you, it'll then lead to going, well, who else do we need in the team? Or vice versa if we're going to be pushing into a different direction who in the team might not need to be in the team in three to five years time and that's the other big you know leadership thing that we all have to come across at some point is that there'd be you know the old analogy that not everybody on the bus should be on the bus to use a very poor phrase but i think everyone understands it yeah i've got some questions that came through about staffing so i'll come back to those at the end okay so okay yeah that leads nicely into the next point so how do we how do we get to that goal? How do we reach there? So I use a really simple uh, model when we're working with clients, which I think can be really easily adapted into business. And I've I've modelled this from neuro linguistic programming or NLP, and it simply states that what we've got to think about is what is the so hopefully if you've set your goal well, then that creates your desired state. So that's the world of the state of which you want your world to look like. So that's the goal of the next three to five years. But before that, we've got to really understand for me where you sit as a business now. So what is your present state? And I think it's important that when we start to plan or create any plan to achieve a goal, it's understanding where we are now. And what I mean by that is, what does your current data tell you? Now, we did a webinar not so long ago ourselves, and we were talking around data. And I was getting heckled from some of my, uh, some people we work with around, the, you know, being a bit sad and a bit of a data geek. But for me, when we, when we run any business, we've got to be careful what information that we're using um, to run our business on. Is it our emotional is it going, I think it's feeling good or, it's you know, I think we're doing all right or everything feels like it's going to plan? Or are we actually using the data that tells us how well we are performing? And I think that's really important that, you know, when we start to think about this, that we take time to think about what the data tells us. What is it that we're currently doing well? You know, sometimes a growth strategy doesn't mean you have to reinvent the wheel. It just means you have to maintain the consistency that you've already done or keep up the standards that you've already developed and grown. 
you know, I'm sure you've experienced this with some businesses along your pathway. I certainly have that when businesses start to grow and develop and change, they, they can sometimes allow the basic of standards to slip. So sometimes the things that gave us the reputation, especially in, 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 the, in the customer service industry of which I think most therapy businesses sit. Um, so it's important that you've got to recognize what you're doing well and how you're going to maintain that and keep that consistent. I think it's recognizing what areas you need to improve. And I genuinely believe for most business owners, if they take the time to be honest with themselves, can could note a few things that you think, God, yeah, actually we we could do we need to change that now. And then there's things along the process that we need to consider. Um with the end in mind so what what you know when we create a plan what does it look like and it and for those people potentially going oh my gosh this sounds quite some people will be excited maybe by that and thinking but also some people might feel a bit overwhelmed and the key for me is to recognize is that most therapists have already got this skill we spend our day-to-day lives setting rehab plans and plans for our patients you know we we recognize a present state model when they come in for the first day and we assess them. We do an assessment. We understand what's going on in their current condition. We've all, we then set their goals to what they want to achieve. And then it's our responsibility to set the plan and, how, and what the milestones of what that's going to look like and step by step journey. So for me, most therapists have already got the skills to achieve these to achieve these plans they just need to refocus the emphasis onto their own business and be thinking about that. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really good points there. In terms of that data then, so is that something that the, the most businesses already have that data? Or is that something that you've got, got to consciously be working on? I think I mean, I, I I would I would say that most businesses have nowadays some form of CRM or diary management software. You know, so uh, you know, I don't think there's many. There may still be people that have paper diaries and are, and are formulating data that way, or they are using Excel-based spreadsheets to collect patients. You know, I would say the majority of people have some kind of electronic uh, diary management system, which is the, that which then automatically collects data. I would argue that if you don't regularly monitor that on a monthly basis by minimum, then how do you understand how well you're performing as a business? Because, and again, it goes back to the emotional, um, and running a business emotionally, running the basis upon actually what, the, what does the real data tell you? You know, and if I can share a quick story, you know, I actually worked with an organization who, when we first met, were telling me they're really, really busy and they were getting rid and all this. And they would say, yeah, we're flying, doing really well, busy, clinics full. And when we actually did, did a big deep dive in their data, that the retention rate was really poor. So because they hadn't recognized things, people weren't staying in their company. So they were, you know, you know, they were taking the time and effort to do their marketing and getting some good leads and some good customers in, but they weren't maintaining them. They weren't retaining them. So again, they weren't getting, they weren't achieving good outcomes with their patients. They weren't actually providing a good service. And furthermore, because they'd signed up to some quite poor medical legal contracts, which were actually filling up the majority of the diary, but had employed some really quite qualified staff, they were actually losing money to the extent where some of the some of the at some times every so, every time they saw a customer, they were losing two pounds per customer or per patient because of the money they were getting in and the money that were going out on overheads. So once you're kind of fed with that data, it allows you to make some more informed decisions. And I think that's why it's important because, you know, both of us, I believe, both of our organizations, our companies, and both of our, the Andy's visions for, our, for what we want of the therapy industry is, you know, is to improve customer service, to provide the best service we can possible. But that needs money to invest in either time to training for your staff, potentially new equipment, potentially new resources. 
if we want to grow and develop and we want a bigger clinic or bigger premises, expansion takes money. So I think it's important that we use the data to just continually inform us how well performing as an organization to allow us then to be creating that excess money or profit that we can then reinvest back into improving our service. You know, I would never advocate that we're, what we're trying to do is, you know, as a business, especially a therapy business where, you know, we need to have a high ethical standard is to be overcharging and under delivering. I think if we provide a high, we can do both. We can provide a really high level of service, but we can also have a profitable business. And for me, most organizations then can reinvest that profit back into the business to provide an even better service. And I think that's something which can definitely be part of a growth strategy for lots of different businesses. Yeah, no, that's that's really good point as well. So in terms of like the, the data, and I think we'll we'll come on to this into this next one. So how are we going to measure this? So what are the key data lines that that, that you think that everyone should be looking at at bare minimum? You talked about retention there. Are there any key ones that you think you, they, everyone should be right on top of those numbers? Yeah, again, so thinking about this prior to this webinar was the fact of, uh, I also think it comes back to what it is, your, what your goal is, because, you know, you know, we've talked a lot about, as in growth in, in the sense of increased revenue and increased profit and all those kind of things. But we did also start by talking around saying, you know, that you might want to be taking on NHS services. So again, how you measure success in that element would be that the fact that you've been able to, you know, get CQC qualified or you've been able to put all the policies and procedures in place that you need to do to work in those services or that. So I think measuring success or how we measure success. I'll go on to if you want to talk around what the, 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 the what I call the big six performance indicators that we would use as a business. But I also think it comes down to you measure the success on the basis of your goal. Because if you're looking to bring new equipment, then for me, a successful marker is, you know, when all your team are fully trained, when, you know, have you been able to put all of your health, new health and safety policies in? Because, you know, if you're bringing in, let's, for example, a quick example might be you want to induce acupuncture. Well, then to bring that in, have you got sinks in your room? Have you got a council approval? All of those things. If you've now ticked all those boxes, then you can measure that a successful um, introduction of a new service. So, or if you're bringing in a nice new focus shockwave or you're bringing in some diagnostic ultrasounds, you know, you can't measure that as being successful once it's been unpacked and you've had your demo. You know, or are all the trains or all of your team competent on using it? Are they all confident using it? And if they're all competent and confident using it, have you recognized and understood how many new customers that you think you can bring in? You know, because that's the other element to it is, you know, part of our plan is recognizing, you know, what new avenues, what new demographics, what new avatars if you want to go down the marketing terminology will you need to introduce into your business so then measuring that is are we bringing those kinds of that kind of customer into our business you know so i think it's a it, you know it's a topic we could probably talk on in a whole webinar alone because i think it but it all, for me it all comes back to an individual goal of a business you know the simplest one is if you're looking to increase revenue then you can you can obviously look at your hopefully your profit and loss table <laughs> and your balance sheets. And, and you can see how much money is coming into the business. Hopefully that's one thing most people track, right? Is how much money comes into the business, how much have you paid yourself? Because then you normally have to decide how much you have to give to the, uh, to the tax man, don't you? So again, that's something that most people at turnover is one of those important things. But again, what you don't want to be doing is turning over loads of money, but you at the same time sacrificing your profit margin. Because so I think there's there's so there's lots of different things that you can be considering when you are looking for measuring. Um, but it's all based around the goal. It's all based around what it is that you're looking to achieve. Because it might not be, 
it might not be money. For some people, they're already at capacity and, and, they're, and they're happy. They don't want to grow and develop. They just absolutely want to make happier customers or happier clients. So then measuring that level of success would be, right, okay, so how do you then measure client satisfaction? You know, are you currently using some kind of questionnaire or feedback system or um, some way of measuring client satisfaction? And let's say you're on a seven out of 10 of people that would want to refer to you, you know, and your role is that you're going to add something in or improve something that you're doing to try and get that to an eight or a nine. Well, that way, again, it's just a, a level of measurement based upon what it is your goal. And that's a bit of a fluffy answer, but I hope that kind of does cover some of the points. No, it is. Well, it's, it's not a one shoe fits all, is it? That's the whole point of it is that you, you need to identify where you want to get to and then the rest kind of falls into place. So in terms of re reviewing this, like how do you review it? Like we have our weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual meetings. And even now we sometimes still struggle to, to what information should be shared at those points. So what's your thoughts around... Um, but the, the frequency of how you should be reviewing. So I can tell you what I would suggest and recommend. I mean, I'm sure everyone's got their own time constraints of what they do. So for every business that we work with, we encourage them to at least once a month look at six main key performance indicators as a business owner. So we look at how many new customers you're bringing into your organization or how many clients. And then we're looking at how many, what's the total number of customers, clients, how many appointments have you had in that time frame? We're looking at what the average sale of an appointment is and why that's important is in many therapy businesses, you'll have different price points for different. So you might have, or oh, we've offered the running club a 20% discount, or we've offered the triathlon club a 15% discount, or there's 10% discount to the local sports shop. But then we've got our self pay at 50 quid, Booper at 35 quid, Nuffield at 28 quid. So I think it's really important that you, you don't be judging your business performance based on, well, we're a cash pay, cash is 50 quid, so we're going to base that. Because if you have a high level of other uh, appointments in your diary, that's going to bring that 50 quid down. So you, you need to understand at all time what on average is your appointment price. We do track on a regular basis what our retention rate is. Um, but we also, we track our retention rate based upon, so how many times would an individual return? So how many sessions would they have in one episode of care, for example? Purely on the basis being is we use that to understand our cost of what's our average money in from a customer, which is a very controversial question in the, in the, in the therapy industry, I appreciate. But we don't do it to kind of say what is good or bad in the treatment pathway, because they're almost as variable as the goals that we talked around for people's businesses. We use it because we can then use that measurement to recognize and understand. Let's say you charge 50 pounds a session and on average a client comes to you six times, but we know that's a 300 pounds cost, well, revenue to your business. We can then work out roughly what margin or profit margin we're making from that. And then that allows a number to say, well, what can we then use to reinvest back into marketing? Or what can we then reinvest back into other services to allow us to still make profit? But what, what can we be affording to forecast? So what could we then be buying in two years time or what building could we have or what new kit could we have? Because we can start to predict the money coming in. We measure our drop-off rate. So we recognize anyone that's joined so anyone who has, and I've got an ebook on this. So if anyone actually is interested and wants to know more on this, then I've uh, I've written an ebook on this, so they can, which is free, they can download it and I'll and they can have it. Um, looking at the drop off rate. So again, thinking about retention. So thinking about how many, you understand how many customers come in, but how many of them drop off? And when I mean drop off, it's the ones that haven't been discharged or haven't been moved on to. A different pathway so how many people come have set a goal but never actually finished the journey with you and so that's an important um statistic because sometimes it can show signs that we may not be doing everything as well as we could be if people are becoming unhappy and then for me the final thing that we always look at on a regular basis is the profit margin and what 
I encourage every business to do, and we currently did this with one of our clients before Christmas, is we forecast 12 months in. So we, we, we look at what they want to achieve by the end of the year. So we set the goals. And then we look at what the, how much growth that is. And then we work backwards to say, okay, so what do we need to achieve month by month? And then to achieve that goal, how many staff will we need to do? So therefore, when do we need to recruit? So it all, but we then, we use that on a regular monthly basis. And personally for me in my clinics, we measure that in the middle of the month just to see where we are. So we can we can say, look, if we've got a target that we want to hit a thousand appointments by the end of February, and I look at the data in, you know, 14th of February and we've hit 500 and we've got, you know, 800 in a diary already booked predominantly, then we know we're probably going to be closer to it. Or it means that middle of the month, if we want to achieve that target, what extra marketing may we need to invest in to try and make sure we achieve that as a business? Yeah, that's really good. And how many people, like, how many clinics do you engage with are doing that sort of thing already? Well, hopefully all the ones that we engage with do, because it's kind of one of, it's one of those things where I actively encourage in it. And it's the data that we, we help them make decisions based upon. Because when I was when I was going through those kind of what we call our big six KPIs, at a very high level, they just allow they give you a big global picture of how well you're performing as a business. You know, you know, and what it does do, especially if you take the time to look at those numbers and understand what you want from that number. So what's the goal for that particular number? You can then very quickly see if there's if th something isn't going as well or is going as planned and then you can start making adjustments so for me it's certainly something that all of our that we engage with we encourage some embrace it more than others which is fair to say because for some people they're less familiar with it and they're less comfortable dealing with that element of it um which is all right people take time to come around to although i come back to the fact if we I think it's a dangerous um, choice to be making business decisions based on emotion or how you feel you're performing. I think it's always good to actually look at the facts of what is real and what does the data tell you to. So for me, I'd encourage everybody to do that. Um, you know, once you get once you've gone through the initial deep dive of understanding how to do it in your own business and where to get the data from and how to work it all out, it actually isn't a big job. It isn't actually a big thing to do. So even if you just did it once a month, it's probably a two or three hour task to do. But it really allows you to understand where you are and what you need to be doing potentially next month to just get things back on track if they're not. Or just keep things consistent. And have you found that the people that you, you've worked with then, so when they say what they think they're doing and then they compare it to the reality, like how, how much do they align normally? The facial expressions is always quite interesting. Um, we've, um, and when we actually look at their own data, then sometimes, yeah, I think a lot of people are, you know, I can... A brilliant quote from the other day when we did a deep dive on a business that's looking to who've set up 12 months ago and on a very, very quite rapid growth strategy, which was brilliant. Um, but we did some deep dive and it was very interesting because their comment to me was, oh, this is why you keep telling me to do this. And when what have you learned? Well, this part of the business is running well, but this part I really have to spend my attention and focus on. And within, because we had recognized that, and what was very interesting in one meeting of highlighting to the team where the data says we're falling down, we could recognize why that was happening. We could then come up with a solution presented to the team. And in, and literally within four weeks of that happening, we were seeing some diaries that weren't like a quarter or even a third full were becoming full based on they were now looking at how they can improve their service or still within an ethical framework. Let's make sure we, we, we say that we never talk around over treatment, but actually in this particular clinic, they were under treating. And I think, and 
So for me, the data, it, for a lot of people, it's a surprise. And that's why we talk around it a lot. And it's why I'm putting a lot of emphasis on it. Because I think if you don't know what the data says, you don't actually know what, how we are performing. And that can be really dangerous. You know, unfortunately, we've, we've come across some businesses when we've been brought in and they're in an awful lot of debt because they don't know how well they're performing and they just kept going over and over and over in the same pathway. And actually, well, they, were, they were just getting into more and more debt um, because they felt busy that, you know, they were going, well, we're busy. We don't know why we're losing it. And it's only then when we start to look through the data that we can really highlight what's going on. And that allows you then to make some really good informed decisions. Yeah, no, that's good. Before we move on to the Q&A then, so we've got a few questions that have come through. How would you summarise what we've talked about today? Really simple. I'm going to go back to the my NLP model. And I think it's important that you, you take the time to recognise as a business what you'd really like your dream to be, what it is that you'd want to achieve. And, you know, I think we're both of the, the uh the remit that let's dream big eh? why not you know have the reality of going what do you think your business could be what do you what do you believe is the great best customer service you can offer and what what does that look like and how and then it's understanding where you are now and it's taking some real time and effort to to recognize where you are so take some time to look at the data taking some time to look at your own personal performance and then recognize where you are currently and how far you are away from what it is you want to achieve. And then it's that working backwards, you know, so how, what, what actions do I now need to take to achieve this? And that, that might need, you need support. It might need that you need to come and have a conversation with yourselves. It might need you need a conversation with ourselves. It might need, there's lots of really good people in this space now offering some good support, you know, and I think for a lot of people just having a coffee, you know, most people now offer a virtual coffee and conversations around how they can help and support. So that would be my, you know, my summary is understand where you are now, understand where you want to get to, and then think about all the actions that you need to take to achieve that goal. Great. No, thank you for that. And that leads nicely into questions. So this is actually one of mine in general. So what is your thoughts on having a mentor? I know that's a service that you guys provide, but how important do you think it is having that? The level of bias behind my answer, obviously. So I'll let's, let's put that out there. I've always... I've always benefited from it on the basis being I'm comfortable being critiqued. You know, I think one of the things is that for me, with every, every business that I've ever set up, I've, what I've always done is I've taken it to people who are prepared to challenge me. And so, but prepared to challenge me on the basis that they only want the best for me. So for me, mentors have been really, it was really good at my early stage of my career when I was a physio. I found I was very fortunate to still have a physio, by the way. But yeah, I, when I was more practicing, should we say that, you know, I, I picked a mentor with who was at the time world class. So I was miles away from where he was, but it allowed me to aspire to be like somebody. So for me, it, it gave me the drive to go stuff. And also, I think if you find somebody who you, you can trust, uh, um, then there's no silly thing to say because they'll just explain to you either why you're right, why you're wrong, or I'll show you a different opinion. I always think asking for help is the quickest way to get to where you want to go. I think it's the reason why sports people still have coaches. I think it's the people, what you know, you look at an elite sports person, as if you want to make an analogy between business leaders and, and, um, and sports individuals, they all have psychologists, they all have physios, they all, so they've got someone looking after their mental health, their physical health, and also coaching and the skills to make them even better. You know, I've come across some of the best business people in the world have clinical psychologists that work with them personally to make sure that they're performing at the best all the time. So I think it's really important that, that you at least engage with somebody that you can trust it doesn't have to be in the industry it might be out of somebody where you can share your opinions and ideas and also make sure that if it's not a mentor per se it's somebody that will give you honest feedback you know i always think that i could never surround myself with people that are yes people 
you know, that just go, you come up with an idea and the law was go, yeah, 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 just do that. You know, I think sometimes it's important that you're comfortable being challenged and where people will, you know, ask you some uncomfortable questions around stuff a bit. You know, if you ever watch the Dragon's Den, for example, you know, if you don't know your numbers in the Dragon's Den, it's going to be a very uncomfortable pitch, isn't it? But also the amount of people that learn from that afterwards. So in conclusion, I think having somebody, even if it's not a mentor, where you can have an honest conversation with who are prepared to give you honest answers, I, I think personally is, is it one of the primary goals to being successful? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that as well. It's, it's been really helpful from my perspective. And maybe this will be one to actually assist us to some extent. So when we're dealing with clients and straight away, it's like, all right, we don't have the money for that if we're talking about some particular piece of equipment. What is it a good way for them to look at that maybe more objectively uh, in terms of saying, right, okay, breaking that down? How would, how would you advise people around that? Certainly, I mean, and again, it's why they're getting the equipment. So, you know, if, if, the, if the goal is they want to provide a new service, if they want to provide a better customer experience, then it's not the question of am I getting the kit? It's when am I getting the kit? If that makes sense. So it's a different way. It's a different reframe, isn't it? It's and it might be that. So for me, I would always go back to, right, let's have a look at the numbers. So understanding where you are in your own performance numbers, looking at the kind of customers that you're bringing in and then understanding how that piece of equipment is only going to benefit you and then potentially what revenue it could be bring in because there's two ways at the moment in time isn't there you know we don't live in a world now unfortunately where we have to save up <laughs> all of our money before we buy a piece of kit we can actually buy a piece of kit and pay it back over time and if you can forecast the business correctly then and you can what i would call manage the risk so that you can forecast it and you can be clever with how you look at your data and understand how much money or increased revenue that that will come in. Then you can buy a piece of equipment and then you know that the risk is being managed on a monthly basis because you'll be bringing in that revenue to manage the risk. Or if you are an individual that maybe is not as comfortable with risk at the moment in time, but you know you want that piece of kit, then the same way that you've got to be looking at what margin you're making on a profit and be making sure that you're putting that money away so that you can then get to a certain amount and then you can buy that piece of equipment when you're, you know, outright in cash. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. It's like we, we, we try and assist with, it's like when we, we're, we're looking to recruit a new member of staff, for example, it's like, right, well, that's the cost of them, but what is the, the upside? What's the potential of where they're going to, bring money in because ultimately that's what we need or how are they going to pay for themselves initially and then how can we develop from there so we've had we've recruited recently and it's like we can see opportunities for how they're going to enhance things not only on the um the financial side but also how they're going to add to other areas of the business so it's exactly linked into what you're saying really in terms of what you're looking to achieve with the new member of staff the new equipment the new service whatever it is but I think everything, you know, and this is going to, this is a, a bit of a controversial comment and I'm sure we might get, hopefully someone might engage, but, you know, as a, as a business, unfortunately, every single person in the business or every single, is still an asset. You know, even as a business owner, we're still an asset to the business, aren't we? You know, if we, if we're a poor performer, then the business fails on the basis that it's poor leadership. We make poor decisions it fails so we're a bad asset to the business and that's why in as businesses grow sometimes they get rid of the leader and they bring in a new one even though the founder could be it you know that's happened in a lot of very big corporates so i think for me it's it's if you're going to take the emotional and the human element away from a business and you look at equipment you look at staff as assets and then you decide well you know if i'm investing 35 grand in a new member of staff 40 grand in a new member of staff as an asset, what revenue turnover and what profit margin can they bring in? And then, you know, if you're looking at somebody that's, you know, paying somebody 40,000 but can bring in £100,000 worth of sales, then actually you've invested in the asset, which is allowed to bring you an increased revenue. So again, it comes down to in, in, in money and data terms is thinking about exactly like you've just said, you know, what's your return on investment? And I think, and also thinking about, if you are bringing in new staff or new equipment, 
it's what training do you need to do to get the best out of that person as well. And I think that's a really important point that most people overlook sometimes is that actually you've got to, how do you get the best out of people? How do you get the best out of equipment? And a lot of that down just comes down to the training that you provide with it, which I know you guys are phenomenal at with your new academy. Yeah, we'll come on to that. So later. No, no, I think that's, that is a really good point. And that's definitely something which we pride ourselves on. We want so when, as I said at the start, when someone buys something, we want that to be the start of the journey because it's it's not completely of us being unselfish. It's like we know that if people use it, then more people hear about it, they get better results, patients are happier, more business, new clinics. It's, it's that whole thing of just putting more high quality stuff out there and good things happen. That's a very simple principle that, that, we, that we work on. I think it's a really simple principle. But again, I think that shows, you know, to, to use some analogies that from lots of other people, it, it's a world-class basic, isn't it? You recognize very quickly that you've got a great piece of equipment that is absolutely useless if no one knows how to use it. You know, so that's not an asset to any business anywhere. You recognize that you've created a training academy so that you know that anyone that purchases any kit for you or have wants to develop the staff, then, you know, they've got the resources there to do it. You know, there's nothing worse as a business owner when you've got all your staff trained, you then recruit somebody else and you go, oh no, I've got, no, I've got to go through the whole process again. Whereas actually what you, what you recognize is and you've created that nice and easy for a business owner because you've almost created that academy where people can then go and learn. So for me, it's a really, what you recognize is you, um, um, it, I think it comes back to a really simple basic business principle you recognize what the what the customer or the client wants you know you recognize that for a client to come and buy a piece of equipment they want to be able to train the team in the way that that's very cost effective for them and it's going to get the best outcomes for the whole business as a whole so and as every business with that's what we should be looking at we should be really understanding what the needs and the wants of the client or the customer and then how can we match that and i think that's what you've done really really well and i hope that that's a lesson that can be reciprocated by all the people listening here because if you don't understand what your customer wants and needs you're going to mismatch expectations and you, you know that can lead to unhappy customers or conflict which is one of the things we all want to avoid yeah no definitely always uh, expensive when you get into that that point <laughs> so, we've, had a, we've had a question asking what was the title of that book that you mentioned oh the story brand the story brand i think yeah it's it's something let me just hold on i'll give you the exact title it's a it's a really it's a good read Hold on. The world of Google, yeah. Building building a story brand by Donald Miller. Okay, yeah, I'll check that one out as well. And then final question we've had through. So how engaged and how involved do you recommend getting the staff and the team involved in these these plans, these goals, these looking at profit margins, everything? Like how transparent do you think you should be? Again, that's all about where you are. It's different. And again, I don't mean to give a fluffy or cop-out answer. And, and I think that but the actual reality of the question is it all depends on how your team will engage in that. And what I mean by that is some people will see that as a positive because they can get behind that as a business growth strategy. Some people might resent the fact that you're making a lot of profit. You know, there is that those kind of people in your team. I don't know who's in people's teams. Personally, for me, I think if you've got a team and they all trust you and they all engage, then actually being having complete transparency with your team is really, really important. What I would avoid doing, though, is using that data to as part of a performance marker for their performance. So I think there's, there's two very different, you know, we've used that before where people are using business KPIs to actually turn around and measure their staff performance. And I think you've got to be, there's a fact, there's a difference between the two. When we talk around the KPIs I mentioned, and I think what we're discussing, then for me, I, I do, I have, I mean, I encourage it and in, with our clients that they are there. I mean, we've got huge whiteboards and in the office, in the main office of where the performance data is so that anyone can walk in and see that because 
I'm proud that we're doing well. And I think it's important that, you know, for people whose, you know, salaries, mortgages and everything are dependent on my decisions. I think it's important that they can walk in and see, oh, God, we've hit, we've hit target, we've smashed target. That means business is doing well. I think it just gives job security, it gives job safety. And also it's motivating to know that you're working for an organization that is actually growing and developing. So I think, um, but do it slowly. You know, if you're new to this, don't just turn up, <laughs> listen to this, then Monday morning, just go, da -da, we're doing this. I think you've got to accept that part of developing that and putting that in is all part of a cultural change. And that does take time. So, yeah, and also if you are going to start introducing this, then doing it slowly and over time and gently to the team and, and recognize from their world why it's important. So I think the data that we talked around here is important for a business owner, but then understanding and accepting what, how is that data important to an employee or a team member and how, how does that then help them develop or what they want to do? And that's, for me, is just, we just change the language or the emphasis of what it's about. That's yeah. Helpful answer. Yeah, no, definitely is. Definitely is. I, I agree. It's like as much transparency as you're comfortable with is always good because it helps get the buy-in of, of everyone involved. And as long as you've got invested people, which I'm definitely fortunate to have a great team, then Same, you, yeah. you want to, you want to have that. Yeah. Yeah, I've got one more question, actually. This is from me, so I forgot that well, one. So um, medical legal stuff, why do you see that's dropping in terms of people doing it in clinics? Why is people less likely to do it or why is there less medical legal? Um, no, you mentioned in terms of, you, you said you seem to be seeing that a shift where people were kind of getting rid of the medical legal work. Oh, oh yes, yeah, certainly. So so as a as a whole, because of the, I mean... Uh, it's a conversation for probably another, but the whole medical, and I don't know enough about it to probably state it, but the whole medical legal world due to a change in the law is changing anyway. So I think there's going to be less medical legal work because of how they've, they've got rid of the kind of the, oh, I think I've had a crash culture. I think so. We, they, they've tightened down on that. I think as a whole in the medical legal uh, environment that most people, it was a low value work. You know, I was aware that some clinics were only getting you know, 18, 19 pounds a session for a half an hour physiotherapy session, where they, they might have been charging 50 pounds self-pay, but were then accepting 19 pounds. And then up to 90 days payment terms at the end of treatment. So if you, if you imagine that if you were seeing somebody every two weeks for six sessions, you know, and you're only allowed to bill them at the end of discharge, and then you have to wait 90 days, that's a really poor way of managing your cash flow because you'll have paid all your team and your staff in that time and all your rents and everything else. So I think a lot of people are becoming aware of valuing their own, what, what they're worth, you know, £19 for a half an hour physiotherapy session. In most businesses, that won't even, they won't even break even at that. So if you're working, maybe if you're working in your garage or room at home, you might be able to break even at that. But for the, a lot of people with overheads, they won't even be able to break even. So that's, you're doing work for zero money. If anything, you might even be losing money. And then you've got to wait, <laughs> you know, five months for your money. So, you know, I think pe people are wising up to that an awful lot and, uh, and that's changing. So that's, I, I think that's why there's a big shift in that market, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't sound great to be honest. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's um, a lot of people have been caught out, and and it's 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 been really sad that you know, especially some clinics that we've known that have taken on some really big contracts. You know, they they, they might have they might have had a, a twenty twenty five thousand pounds reoccurring constant owed money, and that's an awful lot of money to be sat, you know, in somebody else's bank account and not in yours while you're 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 out paying all your overhead so i think it's important that people just analyze that and you can know that if you again it comes back to knowing your numbers yeah brilliant no andy really appreciate your time today great insights thank you and before we finish off you've given us a nice introduction into our academy so this is something which we've been working on for about 18 months now so um we've put together a, a number of online content number of videos and training materials and the whole idea of this really is to help people make a decision on what they should be investing in before they do it 
But then once they have, Andy, you mentioned about training and competency, is then after people have made the investment, which we know is significant, that they feel they've got the support to be able to integrate and use the technology safely, but also really effectively. So that's the whole idea really, is to make sure, is this the right technology for you and practice? Does it align with your goal? And then once you've got it in, right, okay, how do we maximize it? And that's the whole point of this. And Katie, who's been devising this for the last 18 months, has done an amazing job. So we really would love you to visit it. We'd love some feedback. We've just coincided well with our rebrand of the website, which again, we're really happy with. So yeah, we're really excited. It's only the start of where we're at with things. So um, any feedback from anyone, please uh, go go along, let us know. We, we can hopefully take some criticism as long as it's not uh, too harsh, but you know, please <laughs> feel free to share it. And um, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. But other than that, I would really recommend if you are looking for a mentor, if you're looking to get some ideas, Andy's a great person, as you can see from this chat. I always learn a lot just from chatting to him. He's very methodical and um, I always find it really energizing talking to him. So I definitely recommend with getting in touch with Andy. He's got this ebook, which I've written down, which I think we'll, we'll be requesting our copy of that as well. Um, so if people want to get in touch with you, Andy, what's the best way? Yeah, you can either go to the website, it says www.elevatedclinic.com. We're in all our social medias. So, you know, we're on the Facebook, the Instagrams. I'm on LinkedIn, which is probably where I probably hang out the most. So you, um, so if you can message me on there. You can email me directly, andy at elevateyourclinic.com, and we can set up a virtual coffee. We've got a virtual coffee link that you can set up so it suits yourselves. Or if you want any of our resources, then if you go along to the elevateyourclinic.com forward slash light, then we have a free academy, a bit like yourselves, which is just loads of free content of our webinars and eBooks that we've done. So you can just download those as, uh, as you want. Brilliant. No, again, it's always really inspirational, enjoyable working with you, Andy. So thanks for your time. And Thank you. We'll look forward to the next one. Uh, definitely. Take care. Good man. Cheers, Andy. See you later. Bye.